The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We're proudly coming to you through the ever-expanding Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, and can also be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring Back to the Garden. You must always stand in the center of your circle, Wiecka. If you do not, you will lose your way my Lakota teacher repeatedly reminded me. How he could tell I was not energetically oriented with life was beyond me. If I'm just going to journey out of my body anyway, why is it so important to know exactly when and where I am, I would ask. Being exactly when and where you are is the gateway to the spirit world, he inevitably responded. The old man tirelessly instructed me on being present with all of my relations, as he used to call it. Before we performed any ceremony or entered a sermonic journey trance, he had me engage my heart and orient myself with the seven directions. East, south, west, north, heaven, earth, and heart or center. Each direction corresponded with other aspects of life. I learned to call in the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air, the positions of the sun, dawn, everlight, sunset, and darkness, the times of life, childhood, young adulthood, midlife, and elders. With each direction, I was to call in the phases of the moon and the corresponding seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. I was to stand in the center of all these, what he referred to as being in the center of my circle. Every morning, midday, evening, and night, I was to say prayers to the corresponding positions of the sun, seasons, elements, and so on. These prayers were not idol worship. My teacher was a devout Christian and believed there was only one God. He saw the directions and all aspects of life as different divinations of that one God, or Wonkin Tonkin. The prayer served as a method of aligning my heart with the energy of each aspect by giving gratitude and showing loving appreciation for them. Why? Spiritual power is driven by nature, available only in the present moment. It's amazing how few of us are ever in the present. If we're not present with life and all of its aspects, we've separated ourselves from our birthright. When we're, we were designed to be co-creators of reality, empowered by love and life itself. Paradoxically, my teacher taught me that in honoring and aligning with the directions and corresponding aspects of life while standing in the center of them all, I could access the appropriate combinations to empower my intent regardless of the season or time of day. The center contains present, past, and future, ultimate potentiality, and unconditional love. As a society, we've so separated ourselves from nature as to become disempowered. In our attempts to subjugate the natural world, we've left the garden nature provides, staggering around in a shadowy abomination of our own making. Our distorted reality consumes much, polluting the natural world, while we become sick and spiritually disconnected. The future of our world depends upon humanity returning to the garden and taking up its rightful place as co-creators. We can do this by standing in the center of our circle, honoring the directions and seasons. For only through nature can we align with natural rhythms and find our divinity. After years of laboriously calling in my circle, I can now become present with all that is through intent and a single breath. Now my garden 
is just a breath away. Our guest is our Master Charles Cannon, author of Living an Awakened Life, The Lessons of Love, is known worldwide as a modern spiritual teacher. He was given the title Master by his teacher to denote that he is a master spiritual teacher, one who can teach without words. Master Charles and I will return after a commercial break, and we're going to discuss the garden and our way to find our way back. It should be an amazing journey, so don't go away. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Prior innovative episodes can always be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Current episodes are aired daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. seems in turmoil around us, let's not lose our way. The stars still shine down, blessing us with their light. The sun rises every morning, chasing away the cold and darkness. There are good people of service in this world. We have much to be grateful for as we're wrapped in the arms of all of God's creation. This is Gwilda Wiecka, host of the Science of Magic Radio, wishing you and yours a very Merry Christmas. I hope your holiday is filled with comfort and joy as you're surrounded by those you love. I'd like to thank all of you for being our loyal listeners on the Exxon Broadcast Network and for joining us on this grand adventure called life. As the New Year's dawns, let us all stand in truth as we embrace peace. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is modern spiritual teacher, Master Charles Cannon, author of Living an Awakened Life. Master Charles Cannon is an acknowledged pioneer in the evolution of human consciousness. He founded Synchronicity Foundation for Modern Spirituality in 1983 and developed high-tech meditation and the holistic lifestyle, which have helped transform the lives of thousands worldwide. Master Charles' website is synchronicity.org. Master Charles, thank you so much for joining us on The Science of Magic. My pleasure, Gilda. Great to be with you. You know, one of the things my original shamanic teacher instilled in me was the importance of thinking with and coming from the heart. Would you speak to this as love and as power and its power to transmute? Uh, absolutely. I think all great uh, teachers, all great spiritual teachers, great masters have always said that the heart uh, is the gateway, the heart field as the center. Uh, of our individuated consciousness, and yet <clears throat> they know that, for the most part, we have great difficulty accessing the heart field because the mind field gets in the way. And so they first have to work with us to, uh, in a sense, untangle us from uh, our attachment and addiction uh, to the mind, to our beliefs, our thoughts, our stories about who we are and, and what life is that uh, creates a, a virtual reality that we impose upon true reality. And once they have assisted us to uh, untangle ourselves from it, then when the mind field can remain balanced, we can move beyond it, so to speak, and access the heart field, uh, which is the gateway, uh, the gateway to true reality, as, as you so beautifully said in uh, your introduction to this show, 
um, that heart field is the gateway to the here and now uh, of true reality. And, of course, um, that true reality is uh, life itself as a conscious energy or consciousness, which uh, is innately a benevolent, loving, blissful consciousness. So the more we are able to uh, access the heart field and live within its uh, presence in the here and now, the more uh, fulfillment uh, we find in life as we more fully unveil our true nature as one and the same uh, consciousness. You know, it seems like if we aren't standing in the in the heart center or in 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 the here and now, we're left with having to try to steal energy or love or whatever from other places because we can't access it ourselves. Is this what you see? <clears throat> Absolutely so. Uh, I'm always reminded of that uh, well-known song, "Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places." Yeah, <clears throat> and that seems to uh, describe the the human condition that we have uh, entered into this illusory, egoic separation um, between ourselves and and life, or a a separation between ourselves as a subject and all the objects um, that we encounter. And the more we maintain that uh, egoic separation, the more conflict we create, And the more conflict we create, the more suffering we create. So as long as we uh, live in that unawakened um, state of egoic separation, uh, the more miserable overall we are. And we don't touch or find or experience that true love, which is our very nature. If love is the nature of life, if it is the nature of consciousness, then all and everything is uh, innately that same loving energy. Often people will say to me that they, they can't find uh, love or that they have difficulty accessing uh, the experience of love. And I always go back to um, Neil Donald Walsh and his famous books, Conversations with God, and there's a statement in there that I've always loved in which he says, if you would experience love, be loving, which draws us right to the present here and now, and that as uh, forms of consciousness, forms of life, love is innate to us, and we simply have to be it, to flow it to live truthfully within it rather than seek it outside of ourselves or in addition uh, to ourselves. The more we seek it, the more we push it away, the more we embrace it and simply allow ourselves to be as we truly are, then love flows fully moment by moment by moment. Well, can can meditation, which is often viewed as a mental exercise, help us return to the heart? And if so, how? <clears throat> Absolutely, and, and wonderful question. Um, in all of the great wisdom traditions I, and great philosophical systems of, of life, I think the most important principle <clears throat> that is taught in all of them is what is called the principle of balance. And it states that we live in a relative reality and that all experience is relative. There's always two polarities. Let's call them the subjective interior and the objective exterior polarities of life, of of consciousness. I'm sorry, would you you explain that a little different? I I don't get that. uh, That we live in a relative reality? No, that I get. The subjective uh, interior and exterior, that's the part I got, I got lost on. Okay. Uh, the, the two polarities of our relative experience we could call the subjective interior and the objective exterior. The subjective interior is the inside of us, that 
uh, formless consciousness. And the outside of us is its opposite, the objective world around us, all the forms of the same consciousness that we are. So subject and object are, in truth, the same consciousness. And yet, <clears throat> we live in this illusory separation of the two. So we, as a subject, create ourselves as separate and different from all objects that we encounter. And this allows us then to have an imbalance in our experience in which the objective dominates the subjective. So all um, uh, great traditions and masters teach that principle of, of balance, that, that wholeness is proportional to balance in the relative construct. So if we are uh, dominantly uh, imbalance to the objective, we have to cultivate the opposite, the subjective. And meditation, then, is the most uh, time-honored technique of balance. Because what happens when you meditate? You close your eyes, you shift your focused awareness from the objective exterior to the subjective interior, and maintaining that interior dominant focus, you create relative balance and your holistic awareness proportionately expands. <clears throat> so meditation then really becomes uh, a gateway uh, to the experience of true reality in the here and now of its happening as one blissful, loving, peaceful, benevolent consciousness. Okay, so let me, I, I'm going to need to decode this a little bit, if you don't mind. <laughs> so, so you're saying there's a subject and the objective. So if we're looking outside of ourselves at the objects in our world, that's the objective. And what we are inside ourselves is the subjective. And we have to find a balance between. But don't we create all of it anyway? I'm kind of lost. <clears throat> yes, we create all of it as consciousness. But the more we... Um, uh, involve ourselves in the uh, creation of life, the more the innate awareness of that truth um, contracts and, and becomes obscured, and, and we lose the awareness of the oneness of all and everything and ourselves as uh, a creator of our experience. We oh, so, enter into... So we kind of get lost in the illusion of, the, of our own creation? Yeah, exactly, and, gotcha. and, and create this illusory separation between subject and object uh, in which we experience them as different. We experience ourselves as separate and different from all the objects that we encounter. Well, isn't that pretty and, disempowering? Isn't that pretty disempowering then? If, we, if we're viewing ourselves as separate, we see ourselves as victims of the objects rather than the creators of them? Absolutely so. Absolutely so. And that is the essential conflict then uh, in uh, the majority of human beings, that unresolved conflict of separation, first between uh, you and your God, and then between you and everyone and everything that you encounter. <clears throat> and that unresolved conflict uh, always results in, in suffering. So that's the virtual reality um, that, that we uh, create and, and journey until we can uh, be full enough in the experience of illusion, of, of, of what we are not, so that we can ultimately awaken to the truth or the experience of, of what we are. So as long as we're seeing ourselves as separate from, we can't access universal love then, can we? That's absolutely correct. <clears throat> because separation <clears throat> and conflict um, um, contracts us. It, it, it densifies us and contracts our awareness. And we lose holistic awareness and enter into a very limited awareness of who we are and what life is as one consciousness. So yes, indeed, <clears throat> it limits us and, and uh, blocks our access to 
the truth of the one consciousness that is all. So if we're disconnected from the truth of oneness, we're dis- disconnected from the flow of love? <clears throat> Absolutely so. And then we're looking for love outside of ourselves. We're looking you know, for love in all the wrong in places. In all the wrong and, places. <laughs> yeah, we, because we, we think that, that, we believe that we don't have it. And what you believe you don't have is what you seek. And the more you seek it, the more you say to yourself that you don't have it, and that's we're gonna, the we're gonna have you to, have. We're going to have to pick up with this on the other side of a commercial break. Master Charles and I will return to our discussion on the flip side. We're coming to you through the X-Zone Broadcast Network. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net. You're listening to The Science of Magic, thescienceofmagic.net. There's more love to come, so don't go away. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Did you know that shamanism has been around for 50,000 years and practiced by all indigenous cultures? These ancients understood there's more to healing and health than just the physical. All four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, must be addressed in order for us to enjoy healthy, abundant lives. To find quality shamanic healing you can trust, you need look no further than Path Home Long Distance Shamanic Healing Program. All Path Home practitioners have been trained and certified through Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a Colorado State Occupational School and are hand-picked, personally trained by me, Gwilda Wiecka, to uphold the excellence of Path Home's long-distance program. Live abundantly. Schedule a shamanic session with me or one of my quality practitioners today. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Master Charles Cannon, author of Living an Awakened Life, The Lessons of Love. Charles, we were talking about looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is I don't think we really understand what love is to start out with, and people tend to bargain with it, like uh, withholding it unless they get what they want. Can you tell us a a little bit about unconditional love and how it differs from this? Unconditional love is a term to describe the innate essence of life. Life is, life energy is a a loving, benevolent energy in and of itself. You cannot really separate love from life. And as a conscious energy, uh, we term it consciousness. So again, the very nature of consciousness is love. Love and consciousness, love and life cannot in truth be separated. So if you are awake and fully alive to uh, life consciously lived, then you experience a consistent and constant flow of love through all of your experience. And that loving... um, energy is what is often termed the high of life consciously lived. It's actually an intoxicating, opiating, euphoric experience uh, of life that is really uh, beautiful, just like uh, what human beings refer to as being in love. Well, being in love isn't dependent upon anyone or anything. It is your very nature, and the more you awaken to that, you realize that you are in love with life itself, that life itself is a loving, benevolent, and blissful energy. Well, that brings us to a paradox, doesn't it? So if we use the normal human condition of trying to earn love or trying to withhold love and bargain with love, we're out of love. We're not standing in the flow of love, and therefore we never get to know it. 
that's absolutely correct. What what we, most human beings experience is a very limited version uh, of love that again is uh, created uh, by, colored by, influenced by their thoughts and beliefs about what they think love is. And again, if it's that limited, um, it delivers a very fragmented uh, experience of love. It's like um, you have this big painting, let's say, or a big canvas, and you have a cloth over it, and someone asks you to view the whole painting, and you lift up one corner of the canvas, and you expose 10% of it, and you say, oh, this is what the painting is about. Well, it's the same for human beings in relation to our experience of love. We have this 10% perspective, and we miss the other 90%. And mm. when we awaken and unveil that, that full painting, then we experience what you have termed and what many have termed unconditional love as the very nature of life itself. Why do you think we've become such a mental-dominated society, and, and what do you see as the limiting effect, effects of this? Um, <clears throat> again, in the great uh, wisdom traditions and the great holistic models of reality, uh, they say that this is the natural process within the relative construct, that we first have to experience what we are not, in order that, in relation to it, we can experience what we are. So we first have to invest ourselves into this egoic illusion uh, of separation and difference and fully experience um, the limitations uh, of life, uh, again, the experience of what we are not as someone or something that is separate and different and independent from all and uh, everything. And when we are full in the experience of what we are not, we awaken out of that into the experience of who and what we are as one consciousness. So the journey uh, is uh, a, a really intricate journey of consciousness in the ever unfolding discovery of itself in, it, mm. in its greater evolution. So we could say, really, that we're all here to grow. And through the experience of life, we grow, we evolve. And what's the measure of our growth and our evolution in individuated consciousness? It is always awareness. We grow in awareness, and that awareness becomes progressively more and more holistic and all-inclusive. And yet the world around us <clears throat> is the world around us, and everyone is at a different place in this uh, journey. And the majority seems to remain uh, very fragmented in that involutionary cycle, still journeying uh, separation and illusion or the experience of what they are not, and that uh, creates a very fragmented uh, human experience and a, and a very fragmented world around us. But well, you know, speaking um, speaking about fragmentation, it seems like our urban lifestyles have separated us from the seasons and from the natural cycles. How do you see this impacting us? <clears throat> Absolutely so. I mean, it's it, it's easy. <laughs> to experience the oneness of life in nature. And, and uh, I'm sure you know that or know many people who have expressed that, that you come into nature and um, your awareness expands. You're able to sense in every way uh, the beauty of life, the innate oneness and, and harmony of life. And uh, yet... Most people live in big cities and are, are separated from that connection to nature, and it's much more um, challenging. And yet, even in the midst of the, of the big city, um, we can still find that holistic awareness and that inclusive awareness that allows us to open to 
all and everything as forms of the same life, the same consciousness that, that we are. You could be sitting in your apartment building uh, in the middle of New York City with you know, 15 million minds stacked around you in, in corresponding uh, apartment buildings, and you could look out that window and you could say, wait a minute, all of these buildings and all the people in them are forms of the same life, the same consciousness that I am. So, so how, do you, I, how do you think if we I can... include that? How do you think if we reconnect with the natural cycles that that could aid us bringing that back to mind, bringing back that we are all riding this uh, spaceship called Earth together and that makes a oneness of it? Can, is there a way that we can do that by connecting with the natural cycles that the Earth goes through? <clears throat> Absolutely so. And those natural cycles, for example, are what I've uh, used in, in this book, Living an Awakened Life, uh, the, the natural cycles of the seasons, <clears throat> and just to uh, see the natural uh, cycles of life <clears throat> and the flow of life uh, that is very harmonious within that cyclic nature. And that happens no matter where we are, whether we are living or rurally surrounded by nature, or whether we're living in the big city. <clears throat> Those natural cycles are always available to us and can become uh, gateways to the experience of true reality. I love that. You know, in ancient times, entire structures were built focused on the equinoxes and solstices. What can you tell us about them and, and why they were viewed as so important? <clears throat> the equinoxes and the um, solstices um, were really um, balance points <clears throat> within the natural uh, uh, cycle. And uh, as balance points, they, w they were recognized as gateways. At those times, um, the two relative polarities came into a natural balance. <clears throat> and as that natural balance was sustained at that time, through balance, the, the gateway to wholeness or to truth or to an awakened, uh, more expansive experience of life um, was accessed. <clears throat> and so uh, those times became uh, ritualized and celebrated as times to focus on accessing true reality through the principle of balance in, in nature. And it's still, of course, true today. Uh, if you honor those natural cycles and recognize uh, the balance points, um, uh, you can access uh, a greater holistic awareness and, and truthful perception uh, of reality. So can, can we become empowered by aligning with the natural cycles? Can it actually enhance our intent? <clears throat> Absolutely so, because the more wholeness we actualize, the more amplitude there is to our power. <clears throat> and that's an important uh, principle, that if we remain uh, contracted and fragmented and limited, we have very limited amplitude of power. <clears throat> we think we're very powerful egoically, but in truth, we have very little power. And yet, the more we awaken and the more we are aligned to the oneness of all and everything, the amplitude of our power radically increases. And that power flowing through us then <clears throat> increases our awareness. Our own presence is the amplitude of that power. And we experience that oneness in ourselves, and likewise it flows through us and empowers or affects everyone and everything that, that we encounter. So yes, it's absolutely true. So if we, if we try to own power, which is what we're taught to do in this society, um, we <laughs> freeze it and lose its potential. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. So it's, absolutely something, so. it's something we channel by being balanced ourselves? Absolutely, because again, wholeness is proportional to balance. 
So the more balance you are able to create and sustain, the more wholeness you are able to consistently actualize in your experience, and that's where the greater amplitude of your power is. You know, a good example of this is great masters. Uh, If you've ever met a great master, it is the amplitude of their power that validates them. You can sit with them we're for going five to, minutes. We're going to have then, to take a we're going to have to take a break and pick up with the masters on the other side of the break. Master okay. Charles and I will shortly be back shortly, so don't leave us now. This is the science of magic. The science of magic dot net, the place where altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. We're brought to you daily in the leader of paranormal spirituality alternative health programming, the Exxon Broadcast Network. XZBN.net. Though the world seems in turmoil around us, let's not lose our way. The stars still shine down, blessing us with their light. The sun rises every morning, chasing away the cold and darkness. There are good people of service in this world. We have much to be grateful for as we're wrapped in the arms of all of God's creation. This is Gwilda Wiecka, host of the Science of Magic Radio, wishing you and yours a very Merry Christmas. I hope your holiday is filled with comfort and joy as you're surrounded by those you love. I'd like to thank all of you for being our loyal listeners on the Exxon Broadcast Network and for joining us on this grand adventure called life. As the New Year's dawns, let us all stand in truth as we embrace peace. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Master Charles Cannon, author of Living an Awakened Life, The Lessons of Love. Charles, just before we went into the break, we were talking about power and masters. So would you describe a little more clearly for me what exactly kind of power we're talking about and what the mastery of it looks like? The power that we're talking about is the power that is innate to life, innate to the consciousness that is all and everything. And human beings, as we know, limit that power through um, the creation of illusion and a virtual reality and, and have a very limited experience of life or a low amplitude uh, of power. <clears throat> and the more we are able to awaken uh, out of that limited virtual reality into the experience of true reality, the more the amplitude of our power is restored or unveiled or more fully actualized. And we were referencing that in terms of uh, a living master as a, as a good example of that. I've had the great good fortune in my life of meeting many uh, great um, masters. And what you notice is in their presence, this high amplitude power, this very palpable vibration that empowers you, that entrains you. It sort of uh, elevates you to a correspondent experience in yourself. And this is why great masters have been uh, so uh, time-honored in human experience as an easy way to awaken. Uh, In their very presence, you are able to experience true reality and, and move beyond Uh, the virtual reality that you've become uh, identified with. But this is true of all awakening experience. The more you awaken, 
the more the greater amplitude of the innate power of life actualizes and allows you then to remain more present as presence itself, moment by moment by moment. Mm. Our guest this hour is modern spiritual teacher, Master Charles Cannon. He's the author of Living an Awakened Life. His website is synchronicity.org. You were saying something interesting about entrainment, um, and, I, and I, I would like to go into that a little bit, because I, what I found is our uh, presence in the world can make a difference overall by what we're bringing through for others to align with or not. Would you mind speaking to that? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, Often as a uh, spiritual teacher interacting with uh, many different people uh, and their appreciation for what you share with them, they always want to bring you some sort of a gift. And I always say to them, the gift of your presence is the greatest gift you can give me. The greatest gift that you can give, the greatest contribution you can make to your world is your very presence, because your presence is the very vibration of life as a benevolent, loving, peaceful, and blissful energy. So if you are living fully anchored within that unified state of being, if you are living in presence, that is the automatic contribution that you're making to our world, and it makes a difference. If one does it, it makes a difference. If a million, if a billion of us could live in that awakened state and make that contribution, uh, it would be a completely different world than the one we're living in right now. Speaking of which, you speak of evolution. Do you think we're in evolutionary times? And if so, why why right now? I speak of evolution in terms of individuated consciousness. All human beings are individuated forms of consciousness. And through our experience, we grow or uh, evolve. So in that sense, consciousness is evolving uh, the experience of itself. Uh, through the relative construct. And the measure of that, again, is always awareness. How uh, aware are we? How awake are we? How fully alive are we moment by moment? And I'm, I'm sure you would agree that you are more aware today than you were 25 years ago. <clears throat> it's just the nature of evolving consciousness. <clears throat> and the more we evolve, Uh, the more our holistic awareness increases and we're able to recognize the innate oneness, the interconnectedness, the interrelatedness of all life forms, the unity within all diversity. And I see in the world uh, today that that is progressing appropriately, albeit slowly, (laughs) a lot more slowly, I think, than a, a lot of us would like it to be, But yet, we have to acknowledge that it's happening. Little by little, more and more every day, people are awakening. They're opening to that essential truth of the oneness, the interconnectedness, the interrelatedness of all and everything as one life, one love, one consciousness. You also speak of the urgency of the times. Would you speak to that? The urgency of the times is uh, always the the dance between uh, the virtual and the true. And uh, if um, we don't maintain a balance of the two, of awakened versus non-awakened people, then one can dominate the other. And where we sit today is in uh, the dominance still slight dominance of the fragmented over the holistic, the uh, non-awakened over the uh, awakened. And that um, is life lived within that egoic illusion of separation and the conflict and suffering that it creates. So the urgency of our times to me is that if we don't uh, maintain uh, a 
more awakened balance that we put everything in jeopardy. Uh, we can, in the twinkling of an eye, not only destroy ourselves, but also destroy uh, our whole world. So we have to bring as much emphasis as we can to the truth and to the principles uh, of consciousness that allow us to awaken and more fully experience true reality and the oneness of all life. Do you think that where we are in the galaxy, the energies that we're being exposed to um, are, are more in support of finding that balance, of finding the unity than they have been in the past? Yes, absolutely so. Many years ago, we used to uh, say that maybe 10% of the human population was uh, awake, uh, and now that uh, number, I think you could safely say, has gone up to 25%. Um, but what's always interesting uh, to me is that 25% of awakened people are holding the balance to 75% of non-awakened people. So where is the power? The power is really in uh, the awakened experience. And I see that uh, and experience that increasing day by day all across this world in, in cultures as diverse uh, as our own. Uh, and uh, it gives me um, great uh, hope uh, in uh, the truth that um, consciousness is intelligent, life is intelligent, it knows what it's doing, <laughs> it is evolving through its experience, creating the future of itself, and that is a more awakened and truthful experience of itself as the great uh, unity in all diversity. We have about a minute and a half left. What would you advise people that are really wanting to engage in this unity and, and, and find, find the oneness? What, what would be the best thing they could do? I think the easiest gateway is love. And that's why I have said in this book and previous books that the bottom line for me is we're here to learn how to love. And if we can first access that in ourselves, can we love the life that empowers us without which we have nothing? Can we make that ultimate value? Can we recognize it in ourselves? And then can we likewise recognize it in all and everything we encounter? If we can learn how to love in this regard, we create the balance that allows us to be holistically aware and awake and live uh, ever more fulfilling lives. Well, it has been a pleasure to talk about these things together and to, to look at them from different angles. And it's just been wonderful having you on the show. And people can find your books on Amazon and, and every place, wherever place books are sold, I assume. Absolutely so. And, right. of course, at our main platform, synchronicity.org. Fantastic. Master Charles, thank you so, so much for being on The Science of Magic. My pleasure, Gwilda, absolutely. And, and in conclusion, may all blessings continue to shower upon you. Thank you. Our guest this hour has been modern spiritual teacher, Master Charles Cannon, author of Living an Awakened Life. His website is synchronicity.org. This has been The Science of Magic. Don't forget to join us on the next episode of The Science of Magic. Do remember, you can always listen to past thought-provoking episodes on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you find your way back to the garden. <laughs>